today I want to talk about something really important. I know, I know, chalk talk intros are supposed to be funny and nerdy and all that, but this needs to be discussed. Oh, and well, it's kind of nerdy anyway, so trust me. No, we're not going to talk about global warming, world peace, or feeding the hungry, although those are certainly important. I want to discuss something a little closer to our engineering home. Yep, we're talking about fuses. Now, we're all really proud when we get our functional design all done and everything works beautifully, right? Wow, we are smart, aren't we? <laughs> but then there's this nagging part hanging around. Gee, I don't really want this thing to catch fire. Yeah, maybe we should talk about fuses. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. In safety critical applications like automotive, we need standards that ensure our designs will be safe. My guest today is Saad Lambas from Little Fuse, and we're going to talk about, yeah, you guessed it, fuses. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about fuses in automotive applications from Little Fuse. Hi, Saad. Thank you so much for joining me. Hi, Amelia. Thank you for having me. Okay, so to start things off today, we are talking about standards and certifications. So, Saad, how are you guys posed to take on all of these certifications and standards? So, here at Little Fuse, and specifically in my department, there's really two main things where we try to tackle standards and certification. For when it comes to the standards work, we are members of a, a number of different technical panels and technical committees that's responsible for putting together specifications and standards that are used in the marketplace. So that's one aspect of it. And the other aspect is the actual certification of products in regards to safety, in regards to reliability. And that put two together is really what my department is all about and what is it that we do. Cool. Okay. When it comes to standards work, what we're really trying to do here is to promote the use of safe and reliable products. And the way that we do that is we are members of both domestic and international technical committees and technical panels. For example, the IEC, UL, STP's standard technical panels, and also CSA standards. The reason why we do this is really for two main reasons. The first part is to make sure that Little Fuse is up to date and is aware of what's taking place in the marketplace as far as standards and specifications that our components will have to meet. Mm -hmm. And then the second part is we share our expertise here at Little Fuse with these different technical committees that we're members of. When it comes to certification, there is, a, again, kind of a two-part aspect to it. What we're trying to do with certification is we're trying to protect the user and their property. And the way that we do that is we ensure that we have a safe product. And by us having a safe product, that kind of translates into the end equipment that our products go into will also be safe and will protect the user and their property from fire, from electric shock, and things of that nature. Okay, so Saad, can you give me an example of your work and certifications? Yeah, there's actually two pretty recent examples that I could talk about. As you know, maybe within the past three to four years, electronic cigarettes have been a kind of an emerging market, an emerging technology. Sure. And people have been using it more and more often. As you know, these electronic cigarettes, they use a lithium ion battery in it. Mm -hmm. And what was happening is these lithium ion batteries, as great as they are, they could be fairly volatile. Yeah. They could explode. They could create a fire. You know, there, there's a lot of certain things that could happen within these batteries, especially the way that you use an electronic cigarette. It's going to be on your person. Yeah. It's going to be near your mouth. It's going to be in your pocket. Unfortunately, some incidents came out, led to an unfortunate results. So what has happened is a standard was put together to evaluate these electronic cigarettes from the safety aspect. Not huh. necessarily from, you know, do they work well, but from a safety aspect. Is right. it going to protect the user, right? That's kind of what we talked about earlier. Yeah. So a standard was put together, uh, which is UL2272, and Little Fuse was part of the standard technical panel, the STP responsible for this. And now the users that use electronic cigarettes, they would purchase a safe product that they have a certain comfort with using that product as it was before the standard existed. 
Sure. The other example that I could give you is in regards to what commonly referred to as hoverboards. And as you know, these hoverboards are the ones that you stand on with, with your two feet and you lean back and forth and, you know, and it, it, it moves you around. Yeah. Similarly to the electronic cigarettes, these use lithium ion batteries. Similarly with these, they were catching on fire, exploding, even when they weren't being used. Yeah. There was a bunch of videos that came out where people just kind of showed you how these things were catching on fire and, and damaging people's property and, and so on. So with these, another standard also came out, which is UL8139 that addresses e-mobility devices. And hoverboards now that are in the market have to get approved to this standard for it to be in the marketplace and for people to actually safely use them. Cool. Okay, Saad, let's talk about some really fun stuff automotive designs, and especially fuses. Now, I'm not sure I have ever investigated that angle of automotive design. So what kind of innovation are you seeing in this space? I would imagine it's come a long way since the old days, right? It sure has. It really has. So Little Fuse has been in existence since 1927. Wow. Yeah. And actually, only three years after the inception of the company, did Little Fuse come up with the very first fuse used in automotive applications. Cool. And that's the cartridge fuse like you can see on the screen. In 1976 is when really Little Fuse put its name in the automotive marketplace. And that's by the creation of what we call the uh, ATO, which is commonly referred to as the blade fuse. This is the fuse that is typically used in the majority of the vehicles that are on the road right now. Okay. All the way from 1976 to present future, Little Fuse is still a player in the automotive applications and, and the automotive industry. And by the acquisition of Ixis, now we have a number of different other products that could go into automotive applications. And for example, silicon carbide MOSFETs that could be used for battery charging applications. Cool. Okay. So what committees in particular is Little Fuse involved with in the automotive world? So this is where the Automotive Electronic Council comes in play. Okay. The Automotive Electronic Council is also known as the AEC. And this is a council that was established in 1992 by the big three players in the automotive world, Ford, General Motors, and Chrysler. Okay. And the reason why this council was put together is products that are used in the harsh automotive environment have to be qualified for reliability. Makes sense. Yeah. So if you're using a component and you're putting it in the car with all the vibration, with all the temperature differences that your car sees outside, they have to make sure that this product is reliable, that it's going to do what it's supposed to do, and that it's going to last quite some time. Yeah. Right? So what was happening back in the day and the reason why they put this console together, each supplier and each manufacturer was doing their own version of qualifying the component. Ah, uh, I see. Different tests, different values. So, you know, the industry was kind of all over the place. Yeah. So the, you know, the big three kind of had a, enough of all the differences. Uh -huh. So they've decided to get everybody together from car manufacturers and suppliers to come up with a common qualification document and specifications. The end result of this is that components that meet these specifications, first of all, you could compare it from one manufacturer to the other. Right. Second of all, that everybody agrees that if you conduct these qualification tests, then you have a reliable, suitable product that could be put in the harsh automotive environment. Okay, so how exactly does this shake out? What's the breakdown of this council look like? So originally when the AEC was established, the very first technology that was discussed and, and a specification was put together for it was in the IC integrated circuit world. Okay. And this took place in 1994. And the document that resulted from that is called the AEC Q100 document. Two years after that is where it kind of expanded into discrete semiconductors. Okay. And that resulted in the Q101 document, the AEC Q101. And Little Fuse does actually qualify their products to this Q101 document. And some of the examples of what Little Fuse qualifies to this are automotive diodes and our automotive diode arrays. And in the same year, in 1996, 
is also when the passive component standard, the Q200, came into existence. Okay. And when we're talking about passive components, we're talking about products such as our varistors and our PTCs, which stands for polymeric temperature coefficient components. So, Saad, where do fuses come into play here? That's a very good question. The Q200 document, as we said, covers passive components such as varistors and PTCs. But what it does not cover is fuses, electronic fuses used in the automotive application. So one thing to kind of make clear is at the moment, there is no AEC qualified fuse in the marketplace right now. Okay. Because those requirements are simply not in the document as of today. I but see. But that hopefully will change soon. Okay. So can you give me a couple examples of where fuses would be used in automotive applications? Yeah, sure. Two examples that I could give you, for example, in the ignition system of the vehicle. And actually, in this example, in the next example that I will give you, there is certain overcurrents and overloads that take place in just the general operation of the vehicle where overcurrent protection is required. And as you can see over here in the ignition system, the 441A series is used to provide overload protection to make sure that if there is an overload, a sustainable overload, that the fuse will operate, that it will disconnect the circuit, and that it will protect the components and everything around it from further damage. The other example that I could talk about is in regards to the lighting, specifically the headlamps that are used in all of the cars and the trucks that we see on the road. Okay. And our 501A series is used in this application to protect the LEDs, again, from overloads, from overcurrents that could damage the equipment, that could damage the LEDs. As you know, LEDs are more commonly used now in cars and trucks. So the fuse would operate, it would disconnect the circuit, it will cut off the power to the sensitive components that need to be protected so other damage doesn't occur. Okay, so given the examples you've shown us, how is a fuse going to be qualified for the two applications you just mentioned? So as we said earlier, fuses are used in the automotive industry as we speak, but there is no qualification for them based on the Q200 document. So right now, currently, we're working with the AEC to introduce qualification tests for fuses. Now it's going to go out for ballot and everybody that is involved with the automotive electronic console will review the requirements, will review the proposed qualification tests, and they will give us a positive feedback, a negative feedback, or just general comments in regards to these electronic fuses. So we could address all the different ways a fuse could fail in the automotive application that would be considered a not nuisance tripping. A fuse needs to operate only when it needs to operate. Mm. We don't need it to disconnect or fail just a normal operation. That is the undesirable result of using a fuse in that application. But some of these qualification tests that have been proposed, as you could see, vary. We address temperature cycling, the hot and cold environment that cars and trucks experience. There's the mechanical shock aspect of it. There's the vibration aspect of it. There's the flammability aspect of it. Is the fuse made of material that would be suitable and not cause fire. All these different qualification tests will be conducted on the fuse to make sure that when it is installed in the automotive application, that it's suitable for that environment. So hopefully when all this is done, Little Fuse will have the first AEC qualified fuse out in the market. Okay, so now that we've talked about the automotive industry and the standards work that you guys are involved with, let's talk about the next topic in certification. Now, there have been new additions to this standard that are applicable to fuse holders, right? Yes. So there has been a new edition of the international standard that is applicable to fuse holders, and that is the IEC 60127-6. Okay. So you mentioned that this is an international standard. What do you mean by that? It is an international standard, and this IEC standard has been put together by the International Electrotechnical Commission. And this organization has been established in 1906, so it's been around for quite some time. Yeah. And this is made up of 86 member countries. Each country has a delegation that presents that country. All of these countries come together to come up with these different standards that cover electrical and electronic technologies. Okay. 
But one thing that I do have to mention, because there, there's, sometimes there's confusion in regards to this, is IEC is not an approval agency. They're not a certification body. Okay. You can't get a approval from IEC and put a mark on your product from them. Gotcha. They simply are a organization body that puts together these global standards that are used then by different agencies. And the way that kind of works is since this is an international standard, to take the example for fuse holders, so the IEC 60127-6 which is the fuse that, that's applicable for these fuse holders. There is a single set of requirements that would be applicable to these fuse holders. And then what is done is, you know, you apply the requirements to your fuse holder. And then depending on the end market that you're going to be putting your fuse holder in, there might be national differences. In some instances, there isn't any national differences. So let's talk about Europe, for example. There is a equivalent standard with national differences that would be applicable to the fuse holder. And then you could use your IEC base evaluation, apply the national differences, and then you could sell your product into the European market. Okay. The same thing would be applicable to any other part of the world, whether you are trying to sell into Asia, Australia, South America, and so on and so forth. Cool. Okay. So now that I understand what the IEC is, how does this translate specifically to fuses and fuse holders? So in the IEC world, there is a set of standards, which is the IEC 60127 series. And the way that this document is kind of broken down is it's broken down into multiple parts. The IEC 60127-1 has the general requirements that would be applicable to all fuses, but then there are subsequent parts. For example, there is the IEC 60127-1. Dash two, which covers cartridge fuses. Dash three covers subminiature fuse links, for example, the cylindrical ones. There is the IEC 60127 4, which covers UMF, universal modular fuses, and that's where surface mount devices, surface mount fuses would be evaluated. The one that we're specifically talking about today is the IEC 60127 6, which covers fuse holders. And then there's also an additional one that covers fuse links for special applications. And that's actually the latest one that was put into the market, which is the IEC 60127-7. Okay, so since there was a new addition to the standard that was introduced, what are the main changes to this standard and how does it really affect fuse holders? So the main reason why a new edition of the fuse holder standard was introduced is it was noted that unattended appliances, for example, coffee machines and dryers, were catching on fire. Oh, goodness. Yes. So <laughs> what was happening is loose wires, components not connected properly, were overheating and plastic components surrounding those wires were catching on fire. And once they would catch on fire, it was a cascading effect. And that's where you get your coffee machine catching on fire. Yeah. So to address that, component manufacturers started introducing what is called the glow wire test and requirement. And what this is for the second edition of 60127-6, there's a glow wire ignition temperature of 775 degrees and a glow wire flammability index of 850 degrees that the material the fuse holder is made out of would have to meet. Ah, uh, okay. With this introduction of this requirement, many of the manufacturers either had to get their material tested to make sure that it meets these numbers that you see, or they simply had to replace the material to a material that would meet these. And what this does is that once the fuse holder is installed in the end application, whether it's a coffee machine or a dryer, it strengthened the inability of the fuse holder, at least, to cause ignition and to create a fire that could, you know, later on be spread. Sure. So this was really a much needed requirement that after it was introduced adds just another level of safety, another level of comfort that the equipment that we use in our homes, we use in our place of business will not cause fire. Now, to kind of circle back to what this glow wire requirement is, the way that you test for it is you would get a plaque, a specimen of the material that is used for the fuse holder, and you simply use a wire that is heated up 
to the, the particular temperature that you need it to be heated up to. And then you push that wire into the plaque and into the specimen. And what you're looking for is really two things. You're confirming that the plastic material is not going to ignite from something as hot as 775 degrees. Yeah. Or with plastic material and when you apply heat to it, it starts dripping or melting. There is cotton that's placed underneath the plaque. And if anything drips onto the cotton, they also make sure that the cotton doesn't catch fire. Good. So this okay. is to make sure that if there is melting of the fuse holder and it reaches other components around it, that that material will not cause other components to also ignite and to catch on fire. Good. Okay. So has Little Fuse updated all of your fuse holders to this standard? Yes. There was 22 affected parts that had to comply with the latest standards of IEC 60127. We did complete all of the certification. This covers the different fuse holders that could be used in different applications. So when we're talking about the radial leaded fuses, the 576 fuse holder has been updated to the latest edition of Dash 6. And also when it comes to the more commonly used cartridge fuses, whether it's a circuit board mount or a panel mount fuse holder, the examples that I give here are the 520 and the 810 for the circuit board mounted fuse holders. And for the panel mount fuse holders, our 800 series has also been updated to the last edition of IEC 60127-6. Okay, so can designers verify that these fuse holders have been updated to the latest standards? Yes, the agency that we use actually for approval of these fuse holders is VDE. And one of the nice things that we have with the Little Fuse website is if you visit any of the different series that we mentioned previously, there's a particular tab called agency approvals. Once you click on that tab, there's a list of every specific part and the certification for those parts. And if you click on the VDE symbol, you could see the latest certificate that shows you the latest edition that was applied to that particular fuse holders. And all of them will show the second edition of IEC 60127-6. Excellent. Well, I think that's all I have time for today. But before I go, I'm going to click that link and go to a Mauser site for more information. Well, Saad, it was a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you very much for your time, Emilia. I appreciate it. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about fuses and automotive applications from Little Fuse. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, check out the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it, it's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, keyword EE Journal. <laughs>